Uh, okay, uh, we'll continue on uh, with our little series on uh, some of the basic uh, components of surgical care. Uh, today we'll talk about surgical nutrition. I suppose the first thing to decide is who actually needs alimentation. And in surgery, there are several different situations that we would want to consider uh, additional nutrition. The first is in a pre-op setting. Some of our patients come in and they're nutritionally bankrupt and they potentially need a big operation. The most common circumstances for this are in the oncology setting. Someone with an esophageal cancer or gastric cancer or even a pancreatic cancer may come in with a profound weight loss. And if their pre-op workup suggests that they're resectable, it would be a reasonable decision to give them a couple of weeks of pre-op nutrition. Another circumstance is some of our patients develop complications. We may not have planned to give them nutrition. They may have been planned to be NPO for several days or more, but if they develop a prolonged ileus or a leak or some other problem, at certain point, we have to decide about additional alimentation. And then lastly, we have long-term trauma and burn patients. These patients are going to be in our ICU and in the hospital for a long period of time and getting adequate nutrition in them uh, will be a challenge unless we provide it to them. All right, well, once we've decided that someone needs nutrition, we have to figure out exactly where they're at and how much energy requirements they will need. It can be surprisingly difficult to decide if someone's malnourished. Um, there's no universal definition of this. A BMI works if the patient has a very low BMI, let's say below 18.5 or so. But many patients have a higher BMI and they're still malnourished. Uh, this can be especially true in obese patients. Obese patients have extensive fat stores, but that doesn't mean that their protein stores are adequate, nor does it mean that they have the right amount of vitamins and minerals uh, and trace elements. So BMI isn't exactly what we're looking for. Lab tests like albumin <coughs> and prealbumin and transferrin have commonly been used as well, but they've fallen out of favor. Uh, the main problem with these is that they're not specific for nutrition. Uh, and so you could have low values here for a variety of other circumstances besides uh, malnutrition. And so if we can't rely on BMI and we can't rely on lab values, at least can't rely on these exclusively, what do we have to go on? And as it turns out, your clinical assessment is really as accurate as anything else. An up-to-date article I reviewed uh, suggested that if two or more of the following is present, you could reliably consider the patient to be malnourished. <coughs> Insufficient energy intake simply means that the patient hasn't been eating well. You might get this history from the, the patient who will tell you that they have no interest in food, or it may come from a family member who just tells you that uh, dad or granddad is just picking at their plate and not eating uh, enough. A weight loss is always important. Even a five pound weight loss that isn't planned um, has to be considered to be malnutrition in our setting. And then of course, your observational skills are important. Loss of muscle mass and loss of subcutaneous fat or edema, which can represent a decreased protein stores. All these are important observations. And lastly, by history, decreased functional status, although potentially multifactorial, can give some insight as well. So the bottom line is the diagnosis of malnutrition is really clinical uh, and requires your clinical experience and your observational skills to make it. We care about malnutrition on a surgical service um, because it causes us a bunch of problems. A malnourished patient is 
very much more susceptible to infections. The immune system is very much dependent on adequate calories to function and adequate protein building blocks to make cytokines and immunoglobulins, for instance. A malnourished patient also does not heal wounds. Incisions don't heal, anastomoses don't heal, and this is of a huge import to us. If the gut isn't being used, then you get bacterial overgrowth with potential translocation and more problems with infection. And lastly, even something like decubitus ulcers is greatly increased in the malnourished setting. All right, well, once we sort of know that our patient needs nutrition, our next goal is to go going to be to determine how much they actually need. And there's a variety of ways to do this. One way is just to make a simple estimate. A pre-op patient might need between 20 to 25 kcals per kilogram per day. A post-op or injured patient probably would need more, anywhere from 25 to 30 kcals per kilogram per day. So you can do this sort of back of the envelope estimation. If you're in an ICU uh, that has indirect calorimetry, then this is the most accurate measurement. And lastly, if you so desire, you can fall back on the uh, famous Harris-Benedict equation as well. Indirect calorimetry is the most accurate way to determine energy requirements. This device measures O2 consumption and CO2 production and can tell you exactly where your metabolic rate is. The only problem with indirect calorimetry is that it's not readily available. Uh, it's expensive and it's labor intensive. Uh, in fact, I've never worked in any ICU that has this equipment uh, at all. The Harris-Benedict equation um, could be used um, um, to estimate caloric needs. Uh, it uses as input uh, sex, weight, height, and age, and will give you the basal metabolic rate for the patient. Importantly, it doesn't give you the metabolic rate that the patient is currently experiencing. So you have to multiply whatever result you get out of the Harris-Benedict equation by a stress factor or a fudge factor, depending on how severely injured they may be. Okay, once we've determined sort of what the big picture is, how many calories we're looking to give our patient, we next have to figure out how to portion out those calories amongst the various nutrients. Almost all the calories you give your patient are going to be given as glucose or dextrose if you're using uh, TPN. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, dextrose gives you a few less calories than glucose. Glucose gives you four kcals per gram. Dextrose, it's down to three point. Protein should never be used as a source of calories. Amino acids and proteins are designed to be building blocks for important components of cells and the immune system and wound healing. And so we give protein for that purpose. We also have to provide the eight essential amino acids that the body can't synthesize. A normal walking around healthy person needs approximately one gram per kilogram per day of protein. In our sort of pre-op patient that we want to give some supplemental alimentation, we might want to bump that up to 1.5 grams per kg per day. Our fasted surgical patient who's had a slow recovery or some complications, we might want to go up to two grams. And in our severely injured patients, like a trauma patient or a burn patient, we may want to go as high as three grams per kilogram per day. But just keep in mind, uh, although protein does give you four kcals per gram, we do not provide it for its calorie source, we provide it for its building block potential. The role of lipids has undergone an evolution uh, since I've been involved in surgery 
in early on in my career, we used lipids as a calorie source, in particular, a very dense source of calories because lipids provide nine kcals per gram. And so this potentially makes lipids useful in patients who need volume restriction or in patients who can't tolerate the high dextrose concentrations of let's say TPN. We also need lipids um, because linoleic acid and linolenic acid are essential. They're important components of cell walls and we can't synthesize them. So there seems to be many good reasons to want to use lipids. However, it's been learned over the years that lipids are associated with poor outcomes. They seem to be associated with immune suppression and mortality rates seem to be worse in patients who are receiving um, lipids. And so the optimal use of lipids right now is very unclear and perhaps the only real use at this point in time is a small volume to deliver the essential fatty acids. The days of using lipids as a high density calorie source seem to be over. We also have to provide 13 vitamins that we can't synthesize. We cannot synthesize, of course, things like calcium and chloride and magnesium and potassium. All these minerals are either components of bone or they function as charged ions. In addition, trace minerals like iron and zinc, copper and selenium are extremely important components of various um, uh, proteins and enzyme systems. And all of these have to be provided by us. All right, once we've sort of figured out what we wanna give our patient, how much glucose and how much protein and whether we're gonna use lipids or not, we next have to come up with a route of administration for our patients. Ideally, we would always use the gut. It's the preferred choice in almost every case when it's available. If you don't use the gut, the mucosa atrophies, you get bacterial overgrowth, you get potential translocation and increased infectious um, uh, problems. In addition, the gut itself is an important immune organ. And so the mucosal defenses will be uh, decreased as well if we don't use the gut. We used to think that anastomoses were a contraindication, uh, but we now know that anastomoses actually heal better when you're using the gut. Open abdomens that you might see on the trauma service are not contraindications either. If you're going to use enteral nutrition, in the trauma world in particular, studies have shown that you get better clinical outcomes if you start early. <clears throat> early is defined as within the first 24 to 48 hours. You should wait until the patient is resuscitated and off pressors. And then once that's been achieved, then you can start nutrition really at that point. Another issue is the whole question of, do we need to reach our goal? In the patient that we're using nutrition in a pre-op setting, then trying to achieve goal seems to make sense. <clears throat> but in an injured patient, uh, it doesn't seem to be that important. Um, 50 to 60% of goal seems to get you to about the same place. And we've also learned that too much is probably worse than too little. Uh, and so if you have a complicated patient, uh, just a small amount of enteral nutrition through the gut at least seems to preserve gut function. So I think stressing over reaching some calculated or ideal goal probably isn't uh, worth it, at least early on uh, in the injury period. As the patient gets through that and starts to enter the anabolic phase, then providing goal is exceedingly important. We can get to the gut through a variety of means. Early on, a nasogastric tube works just fine. There's a few specific contraindications, however, to using a, gastro, uh, a nasogastric tube. Certainly someone who has gastroparesis, 
this wouldn't be a good idea, or any patient who's an aspiration risk, oftentimes this would put a head injured patient um, as a person who might not benefit from an NG tube. A nasoenteric tube is a tube that's placed through the pylorus uh, with the goal of it being positioned in the distal duodenum or proximal jejunum. There's a lot of issues with these tubes. They usually have to be placed down in the IR department under fluoroscopy. And so that could be a road trip in a complicated patient. And these tubes are easily pulled back out of position with patient positioning maneuvers as well. So working with a, you know, a naso jejunal tube is trying. And many times you hardly deliver any calories through this tube uh, at all because it spends more time out of position. Endoscopically placed tubes are used more in a chronic setting than in the acute setting. And surgically placed tubes like a G-tube or a J-tube um, can be really invaluable to you. And so if you're doing a laparotomy, whether it's a trauma patient or a complicated oncology patient, probably you should always ask yourself near the end of the case, whether this patient would benefit from some sort of feeding access, because there really is no time like the present. If you put it in and you never really have to use it, it's just no big deal to take out. But if you put it in and you use it, you'll thank yourself many times over. It greatly simplifies patient management. The major complication of using the gut is that not every patient tolerates it. Some patients will get distended, they develop cramping pain or frank diarrhea. Most of the problems are related to the fact that the solutions we use are hyperosmolar and the jejunum really does not like to see hyperosmolar feedings. And so if you're feeding through a G-tube, one strategy that's pretty helpful is just to dilute the formula, especially starting off. So don't try to give it full strength, just give it half strength. And then you can work up to whatever goal you've decided on by slowly increasing the volume and keeping you know, the dilution at the same level, maybe start at 50%. Once the patient's handling a dilute volume, then you can work on increasing the concentration, but you don't have to be in any particular hurry uh, to get to goal. In fact, getting to goal may not be all that important anyway. <clears throat> Theoretically, using the gut could cause a few problems. When you use the gut, of course, you're increasing blood flow to the intestine, you're increasing oxygen requirements, and the gut can't always respond. This is the basis for the recommendation of not using the gut while the patient's on heavy duty pressors, because oxygen requirements will increase, will increase, but blood flow may not be able to be increased. And so you could run into the problem of uh, small bowel necrosis. Parenteral nutrition or TPN um, can be life-saving for sure, but it is clearly associated with more complications than enteral feeding. Unlike with enteral feedings, where we know that starting early is a good thing, with TPN, it seems to be the opposite. In fact, starting early seems to be associated with more complications and perhaps even a decreased survival advantage. So there's no advantage to early TPN. And a lot of people suggest that you shouldn't start TPN before a week and somewhere between one and two weeks is probably sufficient. There also seems to be no advantage to combining TPN with enteral nutrition. This is something that used to be pretty common. You'd use a small amount of enteral nutrition to sort of keep the gut working and then make up the calorie difference with TPN. But there's never been any data su to suggest that this sort of uh, more complicated approach actually results in better patient outcomes. So TPN is useful when you can't use the gut. <clears throat> this could be a temporary situation or a more permanent situation. 
but someone with a high output fistula that when you try to feed them increases the output, the gut isn't gonna work here. Uh, some patients developed a prolonged ileus or just can't tolerate tube feedings at all. And some unfortunate people have short gut syndrome like a child who had a mid-gut volvulus, and they're going to be completely dependent on TPN. So we have to use it, even if we know it isn't, it isn't ideal, but sometimes it's all we have. TPN is also useful in the pre-op setting. The oncology patient with a esophageal stricture or a, a gastric cancer, um, isn't going to take in enough PO. It may be difficult to get an NG tube or some sort of nasoenteric tube <coughs> through a stricture. And lastly, you really don't want to put a surgical or, or endoscopic tube in these patients' stomachs because their stomachs may be conduits for whatever operation you're proposing uh, to do. So in this particular patient, TPN is certainly valuable as well. TPN has multiple complications. There's the technical complications of line access. Uh, TPN lines are prone to get infection. Um, so systemic bloodstream infections are much more common in patients who are getting TPN. The high glucose solutions are mother's milk for bacteria. And so we have to deal with that problem as well. There's also a whole host of metabolic complications. You're using a high glucose solution. Uh, and so this is gonna cause hyperglycemia. Uh, patients who are hyperglycemic have high, higher infectious complications uh, and diabetics in particular can really have a problem with hyperglycemia. Many patients, this could be managed by adding insulin but you're gonna spend some time and some days figuring out what the right insulin dose might be. <clears throat> Overfeeding with TPN is a big problem. Um, the glucose that we give these patients for the calorie source ultimately is metabolized to CO2 and water. And so patients who have respiratory insufficiency or are having any difficulty on the ventilator um, can have additional problems because of the increased CO2 that they have to get rid of. And then TPN causes liver injury. In adults, that may just be cholestasis or some noticeable liver function abnormalities. But in children, this can progress to frank cirrhosis. And ultimately, some children, especially those with a mid-gut volvulus, may ultimately need a liver transplant at the time of their small bowel transplantation. And lastly, since we're not using the gut, of course, TPN is associated with all the problems of gut disuse. Um, the last thing I wanna say about nutrition is that it's, it's sort of always been the holy grail that you could use nutrition to solve certain problems in the injured patient. We spent a couple of weeks talking about the hormonal and inflammatory and metabolic effects that happen in our injured patient. The trauma patient, the burn patient, the septic patient is hypercatabolic. And so it seems to make intuitive sense that if we provided glucose and protein, we could sort of intervene in this hypercatabolic response. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. These patients are hypercatabolic because the hormonal environment says that's where they need to be. And nutrition doesn't solve that problem. The only thing that solves that problem is dealing with the injuries and getting them healed up. In the same way, many of our patients have a hyperinflammatory response. The septic patient may have that, the burn patient may have that, the multiply injured trauma patient might have that. And the long-standing inflammatory response is also problematic to our patients. And so again, it's been a desire to try to intervene and downregulate that inflammatory response. And it makes sense to try to do this nutritionally. And so the goal of immunotrition is to somehow 
provide building blocks so that we could attenuate the hyperinflammatory response. So the patients we might want to consider doing this in are the patients who have a very intense inflammatory response. So our trauma patients, our burn patients, septic patients, ARDS patients, th this type of patients might be, might potentially benefit from immunonutrition. So the components of most immunonutrition regimens are arginine, which ultimately becomes nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is an important, very important component uh, of the immune system. Uh, it's a signaling molecule. Glutamine is a key fuel for white cells. Omega-3 fatty acids are proposed to generally downregulate the inflammatory response. And a whole bunch of antioxidants are provided as well, like vitamin C and zinc and some others. So does immunotrition work? In other words, if you give patients these immune components, is their immune response downregulated? And unfortunately, in the same way that giving glucose and protein doesn't downregulate the hypercatabolic response, giving immune components does not seem to decrease the inflammatory response that some of our patients will develop. So immunonutrition has never shown that there's any benefit for mortality over just standard, <coughs> over standard enteral formulas. There's some suggestion that perhaps morbidity is decreased and ICU length of stay is reduced, but that's unsettled. But the mortality issue doesn't seem to be unsettled. There seems to be no particular benefit. And there is some suggestion that immunotrition is actually harmful in patients with severe sepsis. In particular, nitric oxide may be something you don't wanna give a septic patient. Nitric oxide leads to a lower systemic vascular resistance, which is something that septic patients already have. And so making their systemic vascular resistance even lower is probably not helpful in this group of patients. So where we stand right now, immunotrition is, you know, perhaps reasonable to use in some sort of controlled study but as um, you know, sort of a primary component of surgical patient care, it doesn't seem like it's uh, entered prime time quite as yet. All right, well, I appreciate your attention. Uh, we will forge ahead uh, next week. Uh, we will talk about uh, fluid management um, with the idea of understanding how fluid moves around the body and how we can write rational IV orders. And for those of you who would prefer the written word uh, over listening to these uh, videos, uh, everything I talk about is available at uh, this website. All right, thank you for your attention.